Thanks for joining us today. In the session, we'll be talking about improving the IHME COVID model. Um, on the session uh, today, I'm Scott Black, and we also have uh, Denny Lee as well. For the agenda, first, we'll be talking about how uh, to build a COVID-19 uh, data lake and some of the challenges around doing that. And then next, I will be speaking about how we can use our COVID data lake to try and improve the predictions that we're getting from uh, the I. HME model. So first, a little bit of background about myself. I've been uh, working in uh, a pre-sales role for about the last 10 years, helping uh, different organizations getting value out of their data. And then uh, before that, I spent oh, about another um, 10 years or so in coming from the RDBMS world, working uh, quite heavily in e-commerce and in the, uh, the healthcare sector. And in, during that time, I also helped contribute to uh, several uh, Oracle books. Now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Denny. Hey, thanks very much, Scott. Hi, everybody. My name is Denny Lee. I'm a staff developer advocate here at Databricks. I've been working with Apache Spark zero since around 0.5. Um, formerly, I was a senior director of data science and engineering at Concur, also principal program manager at Microsoft, where I was actually responsible for helping to build um, Azure HD Insight, one of the one of the nine people, one of the nine people to co help create it, as well, uh, SQL Cat BI DW lead uh, at, at Microsoft as well. So, let's get started. So let's start by trying to understand the Johns Hopkins data set that we're going to be using to better understand the IHME model and try to improve it. As you can see from here, this particular graph. This is a visualization of COVID-19 cases by county for 100, per 100,000 people between March 22nd and April 14th of 2020. As you can see from the animation, the rapid exponential growth that you see here um, of the COVID-19 cases in the United States. If you wanna recreate this, there's actually a notebook linked in this notebook that will allow you to recreate this particular visualization of the Johns Hopkins data set. Now, what's interesting about the Johns Hopkins data set is that the schema of it actually changes over time. It is a very, very useful data set to understand COVID-19 cases. But as you'll notice, for example, here on the 21st, there are, let's see, uh, eight columns that are available for you to process the data. If I was to look at the next day on the 22nd, you'll notice that there are 13 columns. And so the first notebook that we're showing here, which we also will provide to you, is a data prep. It allows you to go ahead and take into account of the fact that the schema of the data changes over time. So if I skip ahead to this particular code snippet, you notice that this is exactly what's going on here. There are three different schemas uh, as of when we originally wrote this notebook, which is on the April 8th, 2020. In fact, there's actually a fourth schema change that just happened recently as, in the time of this particular session. So nevertheless, we have the different schemas, uh, this case that we've listed out based on the time frame that we're working with. And then finally, when you notice that the processing of this notebook kicks in, you'll notice the different schemas for the different dates for before the 1st of March, there are these set of columns. But from March 1st to March 22nd, there are these set of columns and so forth and so forth, uh, March 22nd onwards. Now, what we did is we created a Delta Lake table so we could keep track of not just the information that was recorded, but also any optimizations that we wanted to do. And as well, if we wanted to do any deletions or updates to the table, we had a transaction log to keep track of this. This is very handy, especially when you're dealing with schema changes. So for example, here's some examples of what we had done to the table. The other thing we did, as you'll notice from the previous notebook, uh, we also included uh, per 100,000 cases. So we needed to get the 20, 2019 population estimates. So we look, downloaded this from the US Census, um, and here you go, created state and county tables, similar to the one you're seeing here right now, that allow us to go ahead and not only provide the overall case numbers as per the Johns Hopkins data set, but also include uh, the per 100,000 
people so you can actually have uh, understand the population densities. So naturally, I'm going to want to go ahead and explore the data as well. So the second notebook we have here is purely EDA, Exploratory Data Analysis. So I'm going to skip ahead again. We, we've already read that Delta Lake table that has this information. But you'll notice that we, we want to go ahead and specifically look at the case ratio. Now, what is case ratio? If you take a look at the SQL here that I've written, it basically is doing a seven day average for each day. And we want to see what the seven day average for one day versus the seven day average for the previous day and, by, and doing comparison between the two. And so over time, you're hoping that the previous day, sorry, the current day seven day average is less than the previous seven uh, days seven day average. Okay. So let's take a look. We ran the query already which notes the case ratios for a, just a specific set of states like Washington, Utah, New York, and California. And so over time, this is going from May 11th to May 25th, you'll notice that generally it's going down. But I wanna focus a little bit here about Washington State because there was a nice dip here and then we jumped back up. And I'm wondering, based on the case ratio, is that a cause for concern for my state? I'm from Seattle, okay? So let me dive into a little bit about the, the initiative by Washington State. Uh, it's called Safe Start Washington. Uh, it's very similar to the U.S. government's own CDC requirements, but the idea is that there's a four-phased approach in how you would go ahead and go, go, go back to normal, per se, when it comes to uh, opening restaurants, uh, recreational facilities, and things of that nature. With a nice, steady, four-phased approach, assuming the number of COVID cases actually stays down or at least plateaus. And so you'll notice that the counties that have a higher population, uh, which is here like Snohomish, King, and Pierce, these counties are still in phase one, while the more rural counties, um, they, they are actually on phase two because they're able to go ahead and they, because they have lower number of COVID-19 cases, they're actually able to go ahead and continue on with that phased approach at a, at a faster speed, which makes a lot of sense. Note here on the right side, the uh, County Penn to Oriel. We're gonna come back to it in a second here, okay? So let me do a, some additional exploratory data analysis. I'm just gonna focus on a few counties. In this case, I'm gonna focus on King, Snohomish, Pierce. Those are the three most dense. Uh, counties and some of the not so uh, more rural counties with less density like Lincoln, Garfield, Kittitas, Yakima, and Pandoreal. Over time, all of the case ratios are basically dropping, which is great to see, except for the Pandoreal County. Hmm, that's a little weird. I'm a little concerned. So that it, it claim, explains the case ratio bump that you just saw in the previous one. But let's go look at the data itself. Well, if I was to run this particular query and actually look at the actual case numbers, you notice what actually happens on the 23rd, there are two cases, and then boom, on the 24th and 25th, now there are three cases. So it jumped up a little bit, okay? So it's not great that what we see here, obviously, but over, uh, over what you'll notice is that from a, from doing EDA, the reality is it's not that little jump in case ratio isn't as bad. Okay, and fortunately, there's no deaths in, in that county, so that's good. So now let's go ahead and continue onwards and focus a little bit about the IHME model. Now, there are different COVID nineteen models. These are known as SIR models. Um, that are specific to, well, COVID-19. And so here's a, uh, a select few uh, that you know from the 538 article, uh, where the latest COVID-19 models think we're headed and why they disagree on the projection of U.S. fatalities. There are a number of different models, and uh, like IHME, Columbia University, Northeastern, and so forth. And what you notice is that there is the values, what it is, but there's also these shaded regions to, to the right. And because the the more as time progresses, the more variance is going to be because we're not as sure what the overall numbers are going to look like. These models 
all take into account of a lot of different factors, whether it's um, when they shut down the schools, what phase they're in, uh, what, um, uh, what, when they shut down restaurants, limited travel, so forth and so forth. And so each of these models tries to take into account of these different pieces of information to see if they can have a more precision or better predict the number of, of fatalities over time. Okay, and obviously we're hoping for that to drop. Well, in the case of the IHME model, this one is a specific model from the University of Washington uh, here in Seattle. All right, so you can actually learn more about it if you actually focus on uh, um, um, uh, to their website here. And so I'm just gonna open that up. And you'll notice basically, here's how they look at it. And if I was to just focus on a particular a state, I'll just happen to uh, choose Washington state again. Right, here's its projections, here's its, for its daily deaths, and what you'll notice is that it, it also includes infections and testing, hospital resource utilization, and also factors like social distancing, like educational facilities closed, get, gathering restrictions, steam home orders, business closures, non-essential business closed, things like that, and how they ultimately impact um, the mobility of folks, which also impacts the, uh, the virility of COVID-19. Nevertheless, let's take a look at the models real quick, okay? And so if you look at the IHME models themselves here, you basically uh, note the fact that you can go to the website directly to get the models, but we also store them here at Databricks datasets. So if you just go there, you notice actually the models are stored in Databricks datasets, COVID, IHME, and uh, a bunch of them are already uh, listed uh, ever since March 27th, in fact. And so from here, let, we're going to create multiple data frames. Uh, in this case, we're just going to focus on the 28th of April and the 4th of May. The 4th of May is important because there was a ma massive change to the model on the 4th of May, all right? And so when we run this, you'll notice, for example, the different models, okay? So on the 28th of April, if I was to look at May 6th, there's a massive variance here. Um, it makes sense because it's actually greater than the 428 itself because there's less variance uh, closer to when the model's created and a, a, a week and a half out, it's actually the greater variance, okay? So, all right, so you have a, the, the number of deaths is 870, but the predicted deaths is eight, um, uh, around 849 or 848, but the lower bound is 794 while the upper bound is 1020. So there's a lot more variance going on. If I was to do the same thing for the 5.4 model, now remember, the model's created in 5.4, so basically, again, 5.6, so the variance is a lot smaller, as you can tell, which is great. Uh, upper bound 9.35, predicted death 9.20, lower bound 9.11, so the variance is a lot smaller. It makes sense because it's closer to the date, but you'll also notice that the death count is actually a lot, is actually off. So the the lower predicted and upper bounds are actually uh, above the actual death count. I mean, in that ways, in some ways, it's good. Uh, and the variance is a lot smaller in, com in comparison, even when you go a little bit farther out. But it, it's different for each different state. So for example, if I was to choose Florida here instead and rerun everything, just from here, uh, like I said, we'll give you, we'll provide you these notebooks, and we have a little, uh, we have a little tidbit that says when you change the widget, you can just rerun the cells from here. So, for example, with Florida, you, you'll know same the same concept on May six. Um, uh, well, again, we'll go, we'll just, so that we compare the two models. Um, the the predicted and actual deaths are actually relatively close, but the variance between the two is pretty massive between twelve thirteen and twenty one ninety five. Okay. Uh, versus the predicted deaths of 1470, 1478 and 1539. If I was to go ahead and look at the model here, you'll notice it's a lot closer, okay, uh, in comparison. So um, again, the variance is a lot smaller, uh, but, and the predicted deaths and the actual deaths is actually uh, closer together too. So different states is gonna act slightly differently, but what you'll notice is that there's probably room for improvement for the model. And this is where Scott is gonna go ahead and talk more about how he's gonna apply polynomial interpolation with linear regression to actually improve the models by actually trying to predict the error of the models and then applying the error back 
to improving the, the overall models and the overall numbers. And just like here, it actually will be different per state. So now let's see if we can try and improve the IHME model. And how we're gonna do that is we're gonna be by taking the difference between the predicted total of deaths and the actual deaths. And then we're gonna take that difference and we're gonna train a regression model to see if we can predict the error rate for future days. So again, so we're not trying to predict the actual total deaths. What we're trying to do is predict the error rate from what the IMH model will give us versus what actually occurs. So a quick background on regression models. So each one of those points represents a, a training point. And so the idea behind a, you know, a linear regression model is we draw a straight line and we're trying to get that line drawn in such a way that it gets close to as many of those points as possible. You can see here that you know, only get close to a few of them, whereas there are some other points where uh, it's still pretty far away from that line. So with a polynomial model, we introduce you know, ways to make that line bend and curve. So the higher degrees, generally that means the line is more flexible as far as changing directions in order to, again, to get uh, much closer to our training data set. So we're gonna see if we can use the same method um, you know, to improve the uh, to predictions. So it's a few widgets to set up our, our state and our degrees to allow us to flip um, quickly between what state and again, if we want a linear regression or a polynomial model. And what we do is we're gonna take the predictions as of April 21st. We're gonna use four training days. So we're gonna use the 22nd through the 25th as our training data set. After that, we're gonna take an additional 14 days and that is what we're going to try and make uh, predictions on. So then we read in our you know, IHME um, data combine that up with our John Hopkins data set, and that allows us to create our training data set. So you can see on April 22nd, uh, the model predicted 910 deaths, there was actually 893, so it over-predicted by 17. You can see on the next day, 952 was a predicted deaths, but it was actually 987, so it under-predicted by you know, 35, and then in the next two days, it continued to under-predict. So this is what we're going to train our model on. And again, we're not gonna try and you know, train it on um, deaths or predictions. We're going to try and train it to predict what this um, error rate on the deaths will be for you know, the 26th, the 27th, and so on. So we take our data, wrap it in a, you know, on a pandas data frame, we plot it. And so here we have our plot of our training data set. So again, if it's zero, that means there was no error rate which is the model predicted the exact number of deaths that occurred. So again, we can see that, you know, in the beginning it over-predicted and then under-predicted and continue to under-predict. So what we're gonna do is try and draw, again, a straight line, either, you know, this way or that way that tries to get a straight line as close to as many of those points as, as possible. And so then here we go, we just set up our, our linear regression model and do our fitting and then we plot it and see and then there's the line we get so you can see it doesn't really go through any of our lines and in fact you know there's still quite a bit of a distance uh, between some of our um, training set and our actual line so let's take this let's combine it with the next 14 days so we're going to take the next 14 days fit it um, to our model to make predictions and then there we go. So we can say, you know, days 14 um, up through 18, clearly as we go out into the future, our model is predicting that that uh, error rate will only continue to get larger and larger, um, you know, to the point where we get towards the end, we're predicting that the original model will be off by over 225 deaths. So we take this, we combine it with our training data set and our predictions, just again, to give a single uh, consolidated a view of our training data set and our predictions. So now let's uh, take this and let's combine it with the data from the John Hopkins and let's see how far off we were. So to do that, we have what we call our correct, corrected predicted values. So basically we take um, the actual number of deaths um, that were reported 
I'm sorry, we actually take the predicted number of deaths for a given day. We either add in or subtract in what we think the error rate is going to be, and then we call that our predicted corrected values, and then we lay the John Hopkins data on top of that to see how well we did. So you can see right here in the beginning, it was, um, you know, the original predicted values were actually better. But as you can see, as time goes on, our correct, corrected values actually um, are closer. So again, you know, the, the green line is the uh, original predicted values. The orange line is the actual number of total deaths. And then our blue line is our corrected deaths. And so you can see as we get farther out on May 7th, you know, we we're only off, our model was only off by two, whereas the original predictions were off by almost 200. So, you know, obviously um, our model actually performed, or corrected, you know, predictions were actually much closer than the, the original predictions. So let's try this with a different state. You know, let's try, you know, let's try this with uh, Georgia. So let's come back up here. Let's rerun this for Georgia. And let's see what happens. So we're gonna uh, skip down to our training data set. So you can see here, it is actually very close. Um, you know, the model um, actually was correct on that first training bit uh, data set. But as time goes on, it actually starts over predicting more and more and more. So, you know, a little different type of a setup than what we saw in Florida. So again, we're gonna do the same thing, create our linear regression model. There's our line. This time, you know, it seems like that line is actually not too far off of uh, the training uh, data set. Combine that again with our prediction values, we get a nice unified view and it says, you know, that actually looks pretty good. Um, and we see out from, you know, the 17th or 18th day, we're predicting that the original uh, predictive values are actually be off by you know, almost 500, actually get close to 600. So again, let's see how well we do in this uh, scenario. And so you can see, yeah, again, clearly, again, the blue line is our corrected predicted values. The orange line is what actually happened. And the green line is the original uh, prediction. So you can see our corrected uh, predicted values were actually uh, much, uh, you know, much better. But as you can see, towards the end, you know, that gap is widening. So even our corrected values are actually getting um, farther and farther away than what actually happened. So in this case, let's see if we, you know, switch it and do a second degree polynomial. And let's see if, um, you know, we can even get any, you know, more accurate uh, results. So we can come back up here. And then let's run it and let's see. So first, let's again same same uh, training data set, but you can see this time because we're doing a, even a two degree polynomial, we're starting to get you know a little bit of a curve um, in our line, and um, you know the line was already pretty close before, but now it's even closer. So let's skip down and um, compare this with our unified view. So you can see now that we've introduced some curvature. Uh, into our, our model by doing a polynomial regression, you can actually see it start to you know accelerate quite quickly. You know, when before we were towards the end, we were only predicting to be off by you know 500, 600. Now we're predicting to be off by over 2,000. So again, let's come down here and let's see what that looks like when we lay it over with the John Hopkins data. So you can see that again, we're kind of close, you know, in the beginning, but it doesn't take very long at all. Um, before our predicted values rapidly start to deviate from what's actually you know, happening, you know, to the point where we actually start predicting uh, negative deaths. Um, so you're just kind of an example where even though in the training data set, you know, a polynomial seemed to fit better, just given the nature of how our polynomials work, you can you know, start to get some really uh, crazy predictions to the point where you know, they don't even make uh, sense in, in the case of what we're trying to do here. And that a linear regression model, even though just by looking at the training data set, it didn't seem to fit very well, it actually uh, performed far better than a, than a polynomial uh, in this case. So thank you for your time. And now we'd like to open it up for uh, any questions. Thanks.